Welcome or welcome back to the Dan Nessel Show. I'm your host, Dan Nessel. You all know that I love it when we explore creativity and curiosity on the show. It's something that I love to do. But what happens when you add a healthy dose of courage to the mix? Well, you might just get an engineer turned design thinker mom who sets out each and every day to connect with people, to create communities, and to provoke positivity and curiosity with her unique and certainly noticeable use of pipe cleaners. Well, we'll get to that shortly, but for now, I'm just so pleased to welcome a human-centered problem solver, a design thinker, a Lego series play facilitator, a subject of a New Yorker documentary, and the creator of the wearable Tracy pipe cleaner hat, the lovely Lee Kim. Hi, Dan. How are you? Good. So happy to be here, finally. Now it's good to see you. It's really good to see you. And um, we've been uh, talking about this for a while. I, I'm so glad that um, Brandon Wettstein um, introduced me to you. It was fascinating talking to him about Lego and about just the way that, you know, creating these kind of visual metaphors that help you to be creative, but also help people to organize their thoughts or organize their teams or, you know, just generally speaking, you know, get to the heart of, I guess, what what is part of design thinking. And, um, you know, when he mentioned you, I thought, yeah, bring it on. I'd love to talk to more Lego people. But little did I know when you first appeared on my screen, and, you know, it's kind of a shame that we're not doing video for this, but when you first appeared on my screen, there you are with this kind of two foot tall pipe cleaner hat. <laughs> and honestly, I wasn't really prepared for it because Brandon didn't tell me the story. And, you know, I kind of scanned over some of the materials he sent me. But when I first met you and you were wearing what I learned is called the wearable Tracy uh, pipe cleaner hat, I was just like, what a brave soul. What a brave to walk around with that thing on your head. And then, you know, after speaking to you, and we'll get to it in a minute, but it was really great to hear the story behind it. Now, here you are, you know, we're a couple months later and um, we're actually recording and you've got another beautiful wearable Tracy on your head. And just for the sake of our audience, I'm just going to describe it a little. It's yellow. It's probably about three feet long. Can you just dip your head? What is it? What is it exactly? I'm just trying to see. I don't know. I forgot what it was about. It's kind of an abstract. Yeah. <laughs> And then you have time to add more things. So you first make certain things and maybe it was just like a foot long uh, or a foot high. Uh, and then the more time you have on your hand, you just uh, make it taller and taller. So it's a good thing that we didn't spend too much time waiting for this to start. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Well, I mean, and plus we couldn't fit it all in the video frame anyway. And, and you'd have to be, you know, cocking your head in different directions and it'd be, it would be a little bit odd, but it adds joy to the frame. I have to tell you this, like, I see you and I just want to smile. And I'll bet you that's the reaction that you get from a lot of people. So let's get into that a little bit. But first, I mean, tell us a little bit about like how you got there. Like, so you started off, you know, you came from Korea, you started off, you know, in your education to become an engineer, mechanical engineer that led you to fashion and then ultimately to design thinking and where you are now. Can you tell us a little bit about that journey? Yeah, you would not have designed it that way, but it just turned out that way. So yes, I grew up in South Korea. First, I was born in a little island called Jeju-do in south coast of South Korea. And then I left home when I was 11 to go to boarding school in Seoul. And then eventually I left Seoul to come to U.S. Uh, first, go to language school, and then eventually I ended up uh, going to engineering school. And it wasn't because I love math and science, although the myth of Asian kid is like, you know, we, we love math and science. I was thinking really practical, coming from... Korea and staying in the U.S., I knew that for me to get a working visa, what will be the most practical working visa major is either engineering uh, or math science. And so I went to engineering school and it was really difficult for me to go through that school because it was, it was hard. It was not an easy school to go through, but I did it to get my visa. And then afterwards, I said, OK, now that I have my work visa and, and I have my stable job, what am I going to do? So I begin to explore what are the things that that I enjoy doing. So um, I was working at 27th Street and 2nd Avenue, and that's east side of Manhattan. And just if you go west side of Manhattan, on the same 27th Street, there is a, a university or college called FIT, Fashion, Technolo uh, Fashion Institute of Techno Technology. So that's where I studied fashion. And then eventually, 
I was introduced to design thinking, not because I was looking for some kind of innovative way of doing things, but it actually came through a very difficult time in my life. Um, so I married my college friend um, and I had a baby. And about eight years ago, I went back to Korea to meet my family for the first time with my, my little, little girl. And I had a huge fight. It, just, uh, it was a, a huge cultural crash between me and my parents. And, and they ended up throwing me out of the house and saying like, you know, you no longer are my daughter. Oh my gosh. That was really tough. Because I never was a shame in the family. I was always kind of, you know, a point of pride for my family. And so for, for them to throw me out of the house and for me to come back to the U.S. and not knowing where I want to go or how do I reconcile this relationship that's broken, it kind of made me to just be sad all the time. And that's when design thinking was introduced to me. And the first thing I learned about design thinking was not about like, how can we innovate you know, a different product or services. It was about how do you know what the other person is going through? How do you know their needs if you're only looking at the life and the world through your own frame of reference? So this idea of empathy uh, that I thought I knew, you know, from the dictionary, like, you know, if you ask anyone, probably the most often quoted empathy is putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. Right. And I learned that that's actually not the empathy. You can put yourself into somebody else's shoes a thousand times, still be yourself and still not be able to really empathize with that person. It is by attempting to be that person in their shoes, which is really hard because how could you be that person if you're not that person? But I think it starts with curiosity. What is it like to be that person? And my question at that time was, what is it like to be my mother? before she was my mother. And I began to imagine her life as a little girl after Korean War and as a, a young mother who didn't have much. And that gave me a totally different perspective of what is right and wrong. What I thought logically was wrong might have been a complete different picture to my mother and my father. Because of that painful experience, I took on design thinking in a very different way than many others do. And I think because of that, because I had gone through that painful experience of reflecting on my frame of reference and my parents' frame of reference, I actually saw design thinking not as a process, but as a mindset and the way that we can actually approach relationship, the way that we can approach problem solving from the the empathetic point of view from very human level. So it's not very difficult for me to talk to a little child or to a person that I have no understanding of their background is to be just to come in with like, I have no idea what you're going through, but can you please let me enter into your world and can you show me what it is like to be you? And I think that's very different than the way that I was educated through my engineering education, or even my fashion design, because fashion design is a wonderful way of creative field. But I focus a lot more on myself, my inspiration and my creativity. Design thinking turns whole things around and really thinking about like, I'm not that important. I mean, first of all, thank you for sharing all of that. Because when we first spoke, you, you left that little tidbit out about, about your family experience. I'm in an intermarriage myself with a, with a, an Asian culture and, you know, my wife's Japanese, my listeners know this. And I've even told the story a couple of times here where, you know, my first meeting with my prospective father-in-law was, was not a good one. <laughs> it was a, a real kind of deep dive into as much as I understood Japanese culture at the time or thought I did, it was a real slap in the face about, you know, with, or, or maybe a splash in the face of ice cold water, like, okay, wake up because Japan is not a dream. This is reality. And you're hitting, you know, this kind of cultural wall that nobody that you, you've read about, you've learned about, but nobody can really prepare you for this. Um, and, you know, very fortunately, it didn't take very long for my wife and I to kind of work together as a team and turn everybody around. And we kind of had an ally on the inside. You know, you need the inside man in the family. Was, in this case, it was inside woman. My mother-in-law was very instrumental in kind of turning my father-in-law around. And it all, all, all's well that ends well, as they say. And um, I had a, um, you know, I have a great relationship, I think, 
with my in-laws. You never can tell really, but I have a great, I think I have a great relationship with them. But before we get into the whole design thinking, have you were able to, were you able to um, repair the relationship with your family? Yeah. So I went back to Korea, not with my whole family, but just myself. Mm -hmm. And um, I apologized to my parents for well, not even attempting to understand where they are coming from. And many people ask me, did they apologize to you? <laughs> and I said, that's not important. I didn't go there to reconcile, to, to get their apology from, from them. It was for me to show them, this is how I looked at your life. And now I'm looking at it in this way. And there might be some things that I will still not understand and, and I probably will never understand, but at least now I'm trying to see where you are and how you got there. And it's never the same, you know, because before, even before, as I told you that I left home when I was 11, so we didn't have that strong bonding to begin with. Yeah. And it was very uh, surface level based on the social construct. So when I was in Korea, it was easy for me to be a daughter that they expect me to be because, you know, society tells you this is how it should be. And then when I came to the States, you don't have that anymore. And now you begin to develop your own self and then you go back to Korea. And now you're kind of like, where am I? Right? <laughs> like, yeah. am I this person or am I that person? So I think I will never get back to the, the state before because that was really not the, the deep relationship to begin with. But I think what we have now is respect for each other. And that's, you know, much better than me not knowing, like, when is the next time I'll be able to talk to my parents? Sure. But it's been eight years. And that, frankly, that's not really a long time when you think about it. I mean, especially with families, very tradition oriented folks, you know, it didn't, I say it didn't take long for my father-in-law to come around, but I've been married for 20 years. I'm not sure if he's completely come around yet. I mean, it, it, it still takes a while, but you know, I mean, having the grandchildren and all that stuff helps, I'm sure. But yeah, it does. Yeah. It's still a, a hard, I guess, hard ho a road to hoe, uh, or, or if, if that's the right expression, it, it, you know, you got to work at it and plant the seeds and, you know, hopefully wait time and yeah, whatever you, the goodwill that you plant will, will come back and grow. But I'm very curious about the whole idea of design thinking. So we talk about this, like, Design thinking helps you to see things from the point of view of, uh, from, a, from a new mindset, from an empathic mindset, or just to, to be able to change. So what are some of the nuts and bolts of design thinking that enable that? Like, what are some of the tools that you use or some of the, you know, some of the concepts or precepts? Because I want to have a better idea of what that is for our listeners. Yeah. The beginning of empathy is the curiosity. And that's why the play and uh, design thinking goes very well as well. So if you're curious, then it starts with like, I wonder. And that's what I also started with. I wonder what it was like to be my mother. I, I wonder what it was like to be my father. And you kind of go through that experience. And once you have idea of, oh, I thought this was what they were looking for, actually. But I think now, if I walk through that way, I think what they're actually saying is this. So, for example, my mother, you know, afterwards I apologized to my mother and then I said, like, what kind of gift would you like for me to bring? And my mother would say, like, X, Y, and Z. And you can never take her words as if she said, like, I want, you know, uh, five different things in these colors. You, you have to think about, like, why is she asking that? And you kind of have to think about that words beyond what is being said. And that's what design thinking actually allows you to do. It's not what you hear. But why people say certain things, it's not what you observe, what you see, but it's why people do it a certain way. So the first part of that curiosity driven empathy. And then once you have the idea of like, oh, I think this is it. Then we go into something called defined phase. Like they, that's where like, oh, I think this is the, the needs they have. So like, although my mother said, I want some Dior lipsticks, that's not what she really wants. She wants to show something to her, um, her family. And then you then begin to ideate around like, okay, what can I do to show what she's really looking to, to display to the family? And you begin to come up with many different ideas, right? And then ideas are not real. 
they are just in your head. So when you see these pipe cleaner hats, this is also an idea, part of the design thinking process, which is materializing what you have in your head into something that you can see. And that's part of the prototyping portion. And then all of those things are not really finalized until you go out and actually test things out. So we have this process of design thinking mindset where it includes a curiosity, collaboration with others. It's not, I don't think I have ever, ever done any design thinking myself alone. They're always partners. And then there is this process of creation, right? Not just one, but many other things. And not just one way, but many other ways. And all throughout the process, you want to include people you're designing it for. And so it's not just to, you know, in your own room, kind of writing down your novel, you actually have to go out and test things out. So if you have a design thinking mindset, which is collaborative, which is curiosity driven, uh, which is empathy based, then you will follow the process of defining who your user is. I mean, user is not really the best word to use, but the one you're designing it for. And then you define the problems for them. And then you ideate around the ideas that you create prototypes that you can see and feel and and really do something with. And then you go out and test. And this whole experimental mindset is something that I really love because I don't really have to have an answer when I'm starting. I just have to be able to do this many times until I get to the answer. And I don't have to do it alone because, you know, design thinking by design is collaborative. So I'm always looking for partners to do things with. And I I think I consider myself not so smart, but a person who is kind of can bring other smart people into my world. So design thinking is perfect, right? Because there are always people out there who is willing to create something special with you. And so that makes me humble about my ability to create something because I alone cannot create the solution, but it's with others I can really make something special. It's very clear, it's much clearer to me now, at least, that why empathy is such an important part of this process. How can you collaborate with others and really try to get at what they need, what their needs are, that they may not be able to put into words or they may not be able to enunciate or actually like as you're saying with your mother say one thing and mean something else (laughs) this is maybe something similar but back in the in a distant not too far distant but a a previous iteration of myself I was doing you know it's between things and I decided to try my hand at real estate and real estate investing or I didn't give enough time because I did start to do something else pretty soon thereafter but I ended up working, you know, in in real estate a little bit. And one of the first things that we kind of learned from experienced agents is when somebody tells you that they want three bedrooms and, you know, they want to live on a golf course and they need a pool, you can look for that. An experienced agent, anybody can go online and check off those boxes and sort and find properties like, but really you should be asking, what do they want? Like, it's not that they want three bedrooms, right? It's that, oh, they need some extra privacy. They like to entertain, so they need guests. They want to have places for guests to stay or they work from home. So there's a, there's a need for a quiet office space in addition to space to sleep. And they want to live on a golf course because they, don't want, they want to be secluded. They don't want to have people behind them and, you know, so on and so forth. So if you can then, you know, understand what those needs are and, you know, creatively find the right properties that meet those needs, then you're much more likely to be a successful real estate person, I suppose. So it goes down to finding the unspoken need, I guess. And I really understanding your, you know, your customer or your, your, the person that you're collaborating with, or, you know, the, the, the user as, as I know it's a terrible word, you know, but it is, it is what it is. Yeah, but anyway, it just it just reminds me of all that, and it's starting start, starting to dawn on me. I don't think any one of those people would say that they were a design thinker, right? Or that or they knew that. It just to systematize that seems to be something that's that's well overdue. Well, that's why I think a lot of people when they are first introduced to design thinking, they're like, "This is how I do things," but I didn't know there was name for it. And if I didn't, you know, now actually I know where to start. So for me. You know, when people say like, how did you learn design thinking? I think because I had a need to find a way to really understand what is it my, my, my mother is really struggling to express. And it didn't come from her telling me, right? She didn't tell me like, 
hey, Lee, I'm really trying to do this. She couldn't articulate it because in her mind, that's not what she wanted. But if I really dig into what she's saying and based on the journey that I have seen through my head, I can actually see what she's saying without saying what she's really trying to explain. It's a wonderful way of being free from your judgment. And I mean, I still judge, by the way, you know, like, although, although you, you want to be uh, judgment free and assumption free, we are so trained to be that way because it protects us from the world, right? Um, yeah. But it, at least this is another way of unlayering and kind of discovering something that's hidden. Well, this whole idea of judgment versus curiosity is something we spoke about earlier, but it's, it's one of these core things that I think about a lot. And I've spoken with a few, few folks about it. And the great Ted Lasso talked about it in his show. I think I mentioned that to you too. Like, you know, be, be curious, not judgmental. I don't think he even invented that. that. That might even be a Walt Whitman thing that was pulled forward into the show. Um, I'll have to check on that. But the point is, that's what you're saying, right? Be, be curious and not judgmental. Even, we're all judge, we all judge every now and then. And, and as a human being, you kind of have to. You have to get to the point where you have to judge whether a situation is right for you or wrong for you and you have to make a decision, right? Yeah. Curiosity does not, does not indicate a decision is being made. It, it indicates wanting to know, getting, gathering the information part of the whole phase that will lead to some kind of a decision or a choice at some point, whether whatever the, the, the case may be, you know, it doesn't have to be a life or death business decision. It could just be, do I want to use the color purple for this, the color blue for this? You start off with curiosity and you'll get there. What I'm curious about uh, and, and why I, I really have been relishing this conversation so far, but also looking forward to it for weeks is you are a walking magnet for curiosity. Okay. And again, I'm just going to say to our listeners here that you got to see it to believe it. And in fact, I will include a link to Lee's documentary that was in the New Yorker so you can see it. It's amazing. The whole idea of the wearable Tracy, the pipe cleaner hat. And by calling it a pipe cleaner hat, I really feel like I'm, I'm underselling it, but, but it, it, that's what it is. Can you go into like, how did the wearable Tracy start? And, I, and like, you know, I, I think it's a fascinating story, but it's also this kind of journey of putting yourself out there in a way that I don't think people really quite grasp. So I don't want to foreshadow too much, but can you go into that a little bit? How, how you got to, to the wearable Tracy? As I mentioned, I was introduced to design thinking in a very difficult time in my life. And the one who asked me about empathy and the one who showed me about how you can actually create different world or different solutions through this empathy-based reasoning, her name was Tracy. Uh, well, she, her name still is Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and she became a really good friend. You know, we almost talk weekly, um, if not daily. She became my mentor and she's the one who gave me the opportunity to really teach alongside her and give me an opportunity to not just to do the things, but also practice it. And so you would think that like, oh, wow, you know, she's really good friend and you probably, you know, really relish her the relationship. And I do, but I have this condition that I forget dates, you know, <laughs> like, so of course, um, I remember my birthday and I remember my social security number, but if you ask me like, long time ago, what's your husband's birthday? I, I probably would not like remember that one until like, you know, year 10. Like <laughs> that's not something that I remember. So I usually like play with some kind of game, right? Okay. My mother's birthday is three days after my father. My father's birthday is a month and a day later. My brother's birthday is a week later than mine. So like you have like the kind of formulas to remember your whole birthdays. And Tracy's birthday, I forgot. So it was May 20th of 2017. So now the whole world knows Tracy's birthday. And I forgot her birthday. And it was Saturday morning. I was going, so I live in the Bronx and I was going to a workshop in Dumbo in Brooklyn. And I got a Facebook notification. No matter whether you put your friend's birthday or not, if you're, face, if you're Facebook friends, Facebook will let you know it's your friend's birthday and you should celebrate. And I have gotten this kind of notification from many others. But for some reason, for this particular day, it really bothered me that it was notification from a technology that's making me to celebrate. And I didn't want to just send her, happy birthday, Tracy. I'm really happy. You, I hope you enjoy your, your day. 
she was more than that, right? She deserved more than that. So, um, so I thought about like, what is something that she and I share together? What's the common language that we share together? And pipe cleaner, although I've never used it in Korea when I was growing up, pipe cleaner is something that we always use in our design thinking mm. workshop. So it's something that she and I both knows. If I pull out a pipe cleaner, she will know exactly what I meant by it. You're going to create something. So I made a tiny birthday crown out of uh, red pipe cleaners that I bought from a dollar store nearby the subway station. And I wore it. I wore it for a whole day. And that was the first time I actually wore something whole day. I've done something in the workshops, but not for the whole day, inside, outside. And that's when I realized I was being very conscious of how I look and what people will think. I've never thought about those kinds of things before, but when you're out there walking around, and um, of course you see now like two feet tall crown, but that one probably was about six inch. You know, it was not that big. But because I've never worn those kind of things out in the world, every look was emphasized. Every kind of turn of the head was emphasized. Well, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not something that commonly happens. I mean, you're not, you're not going out on the street with your pipe cleaner hat on, you know, if you're just, if you're just anybody else in the world, except for Lee Kim. I mean, you you know, even a six inch pipe cleaner crown, I mean, I can imagine this kind of self-consciousness you must feel when you kind of put that on, you know, and, and go out there when nobody else is doing it. Right. Yeah. It's a certain kind of, I don't know what you want to call it. It's a certain kind of, it's a certain kind of bravery or courage or, you know, chutzpah or whatever. There's a whole lot of uh, words that can probably describe that. But anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. So. No, no. Whatever the reason was, yeah. I thought that was the day that really made me think about how people look at me and how I look at others as well, because, you know, as a reflection. And then the next day, uh, Sunday, my daughter was just going through my bag and she was asking me about these pipe cleaners. And I, that's when I decided I'm going to actually do a project one of your project, creating something new every day, and I'm going to actually wear it. And I'm not going to do it for one day. I'm going to do it for 365 days. So until next birthday for Tracy, I'm going to create something new every day, wear it from nine to five. And if somebody asks me what this head is about, then I'll tell them why I'm doing this and what this is about. And then I'm also wanted to connect with that person by asking the name. And there was no like deep thought that went into this, right? But I just wanted to make three rules and kind of one building on another. And although nobody was checking on the rules, it was a rule that I gave to myself that I said, I'm going to abide by it no matter what day, day that was, you know, Saturday or Sunday. So 365 days, I did it every day. Whew. Now I'm taking a little bit easy in, you know, Saturday and Sundays. And sometimes when I don't feel like making one, I don't. But that was how it all began. And for a whole year, yeah. I have gone through different experiences of wearing it, where people make fun of me, where people kind of like sometimes admire uh, as it got better every day. Because <laughs> in the beginning, it, it wasn't as structured as it was. It was just like bird nest on my head. And I certainly did not <laughs> look like, a, a, you know, an artist. Now people look at it and they say, oh, wow, this, you know. It looks very, very like three D printed. It does. It looks three D printed. It, it's intricate. Um, it's very, like I said, abstract. Today's one. Today's is abstract for sure. Yeah. And I can't even begin to think of how I would construct that. But it looks like it's engineered. Like, like you can tell. Okay, somebody who understands structure put this together, or a lot of trial and error got you to that point. But it's unbelievable how um, how it kind of, you know it moves with you too, because it's pipe cleaners, right? So it's not some stuff, but it moves with you, but it's very, it's very, it looks solid. Yeah. So, you know, again, I, this is one of those times where I'll just have to rely on <laughs> the accuracy of my words here to create a picture in our listeners' heads. But it's like going from a bird's nest to what you have now is not, you know. Like a Christmas tree in different ways, right? I can just put some lights on and... <laughs> You could, right? It's just, but I can imagine people looking at you, right? And and questioning yeah. you and giving you the oddball. I mean, it is New York, so maybe a lot of people are like, eh. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. but I'm sure that you got some looks and you, you dealt with that though. In the beginning, it was hard because who likes to hear people yelling at you and saying like, hey, 
you know, what are you doing? What's on your head? Did you see that you have something on your head? And I'm like, of course I do, you know, but, but eventually you begin to meet people and it wasn't from, from the very first day, but you begin to meet people who are actually very curious about what you have. And right. you begin to see that actually this one allows people to connect with you. This one, if I didn't have walking into a building, I'll just walk same pathways, meet basically the same people. And I will not have a new connection other than people who I work with. This, if I'm walking into the building, whether I know that person or not, they will do a double take, right? And I actually had a person like me going this way and then the other person going that way. And then they, and he will come back and say like, oh, what is that? And then, yeah, yeah. And whoever the person who stops and turn, or turn back and ask me the question, I'm like, I'm so glad you asked because you obviously are a very curious person. And I love to get to know a person who is curious, whose curiosity was so great that you had to turn back and, and come back. And, and usually that person is very open-minded and actually the person that I would like to get to know more. So I have made friends in a bathroom, you know, like I'm walking out of the bathroom <laughs> yeah. and I actually talked to the person this morning. Um, who I met in the bathroom and she and I collaborated in a few things and, you know, people in the, in a kitchen and cafeteria on the streets, in the venue, in the meetings. And yeah, more than enough times, I'm just like in all of these people who are curious. And I tell people like, if it was me on the other side and there's another person wearing pipe cleaner hat, I don't know if I would be in, brave enough to actually approach that person and say like, what is that? Well, not, maybe not, maybe not then. <laughs> but I mean, it says a lot about your humility when you say that you are in awe of people who would come and approach you. I mean, you're the one who's creating these things and putting them on your head and walking around. I mean, I think it's the other way around too. There's, it's a mutual sense of awe that curiosity ignites here where people are seeing, well, you are like, you're putting yourself out there with in a very artistic and noticeable way. I mean, it's, it's, and colorful and, you know, clearly something that people don't see. And actually, you know, how do you do it? Like, what are the logistics of it? Because obviously it would take me hours and hours and hours to put together anything close to what you, what you have there. And in such a way that's, that it will actually balance and sit on my head in a good way. But you're doing these every single day. Where do you find the time and, and how long does it take? Yeah. So in the beginning, it was on my way to work. So I live in the Bronx and my work is um, midtown Manhattan. So it takes about 45 minutes to 50 minutes on the public transit. And that's the time that I actually make it, uh, you know, sit down in the bus. I live at the end of the bus line and I live also at the end of the subway line. So that gives me a, a good chance for me to get a seat and, and then I, as soon as I sit down, or actually as, as I'm walking down to the subway stations, I can actually do it on the, on the run, on the walk. And I create the base first, and then I build it up. Um, if I'm making a crown and I build a face, if I'm making a mask. And by the time I get to Grand Central, it's done. And I just have to put it on um, you know, as I walk out the station. And I just keep package of pipe cleaners in my bag. So if I see a little child, uh, and sometimes it happens, and usually children are very curious and they will be like, what, are, what is that you're making? And I'll say, I'll make, you a, I'll, I'll make you a little bird. I don't have that much time to make the whole crown, but you know, in five minutes I can make a tiny bird and they are more than happy to just to, you know, get the gift and, and run to their next step. That's amazing to me because I all I want to do if I'm commuting and, and I'm so happy I don't really commute, but all I want to do is either is either sleep you know, or, or like listen to something. I like, I, I don't find my train time to be very productive or creative. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to think things through a little bit more because you're putting me to shame on that one. Um, I think it's a great time to really, to really connect with um, some purpose or meaning. It really is. Then I actually try to do both. So like, you know, I was like, let me not just to do making, let me also listen to podcasts or audio books. And I try that. But I actually, what I realized was when I'm making, I'm also wandering in my head and I'm thinking about a lot of things and I don't have that much time that I spend purposefully thinking about nothing but everything. 
And so if I listen to audio books, then I have to now focus on the, the, the book. If I'm listening to music, I actually listen to music. So when I do pipe cleaning or hat making, I actually don't do anything other than making. And while I'm weaving, I actually let my mind wander. And I find that to be really meditative, you know, almost like, oh, totally. You don't know what you were thinking, but at the end, you're kind of glad that your mind went hundred different ways. People approach creativity and, and, you know, you could say ma- making, and that's, that's, it's exactly the way I kind of sometimes define it is just making something that wasn't there before. That's creativity, right? Or that's creation. Um, and creativity is, is just getting to that. But, you know, people who are creative, they, they often will say that they just need to be in the zone, right? And, you know, there's any number of people who've, who've tried to define the zone of genius or talk about flow and, and so on. And, you know, we often hear from like the likes of, I guess, Gay Hendricks or, 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 or Adam Grant or, you know, these, these big names about, about this. But it seems that, you know, you tend to just get into that, that zone and that helps you to be creative. But, you know, these are elaborate designs. Obviously, you know, you would think that you have to keep dipping back into the well and eventually the well would run dry. So you mentioned to me, and, I, and I'm going to cheat a little bit because I know the answer to this question, but yeah. you mentioned to me before about, you know, the importance of collaboration in design thinking, but your wearable Tracy's, these, these hats are actually a collaborative effort, right? So yeah, how do you get the ideas for this and, and how does that work? So as I mentioned for the first year, I made one every day and it was just shapes or whatever that came out was made based on what I felt like making. And on the last day of Wearable Tracy one year project, my husband was just ecstatic that I was going to finish this, this project. And my daughter, not so much. So she, I started this when she was five and now she's six at that time, right? 2018. And she said, I don't want you to stop. And so I made a deal with her. I said, okay, I'm going to continue in one condition that you become my inspiration that you draw and based on your drawing, I'll take your inspiration and then I'll make it. So it's not going to be a replica of what you're drawing, but the shapes will be inspired by what you draw. She took on the challenge, you know, almost immediately and she began to draw each day. And sometimes she doesn't want to draw and that's okay because other times she drew like five pages. So based on her drawing, I'll make things. And then oftentimes when I walk out with her, people will be like, oh, did you did your daughter make that? And then she will say, no, but I inspired. Yeah. And I think that is just for for me, that's wonderful to hear because I want my daughter to grow up, not just making things, but also know the power that she has in inspiring others. Although she is, she was only six and now she's nine. Every day she creates things. Mm -hmm. And then every day her creation inspires me to make things. And sometimes you know, as I did in the beginning of pandemic, I stopped making it. I was like, I'm not traveling to work. I don't have subway ride, 45 minutes. I'm not going to make it. And it was, it was Hannah, again, kind of pushing me and say like, mommy, why aren't you making it? I'm holding my end of the bargain. I'm doing every day and you're not doing your part of the bargain. And so I was like, you're right. I have to. And so, you know, there's, there's no other reason other than she and I, decide to make it together and you know, she pushing me forward with it. And then seeing that, like, actually my making it, it's not just for myself anymore. Mm-hmm. Although sometimes it makes others uncomfortable and it makes me uncomfortable. Many other times it actually brings the smile that you mentioned and the feeling of joy in others as well. So, you know, the partnership definitely <laughs> pushed me when I didn't want to do it or sometimes reminds me that there is better things out there if you just continue on the journey. I can't underestimate or undervalue that inspiration piece, but it's also the motivation, right? I mean, you know, the whole idea of collaboration always appealed to me just simply because you're accountable to somebody else. And if you drop the ball, then, you know, it's, it's easy to forgive yourself or just to pretend like it didn't happen and make up excuses. But if you have somebody else there who's, who's counting on you to do these great things, you know, you're going to do them. And uh, you're going to keep doing them. And you've been doing them now for four years. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a lot of pipe cleaners and a lot of designs. Yeah. You know, and, and, yet, and yet you seem to still keep it fresh. You know, is, is, your, is your daughter still drawing every day and, or almost every day and you're still doing it? Yeah. Yep. She has 
number of sketchbooks that's filled with drawings and much better artists than myself. But yeah, I'm happy that she she continues to, you know, find her way of doing creations and inspiring me. It's amazing to me because you also have a day job. I mean, it's it's not like it's not like you're just some person who decided to bring joy to the world with pipe cleaners. I mean, although although that would not be a terrible mission, you know. We haven't gotten into what you think your your real purpose is, but I mean, it seems to me though that bringing happiness and joy and 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 kind of curiosity is part of it. Now, have you thought about that before? Like, have you have you figured out what your purpose is at this point? No, still working toward it. Yeah, I don't think I. Yeah, I don't think I think about the big things. I, uh, but I have been thinking a lot about how lucky I am. I was actually talking to my husband yesterday. It was my. So, you know, after I graduated from college, from engineering, I was an engineer. I was actually an engineer for 15 years working on transit and pedestrian analysis in New York City. And it was my HR in that engineering firm who recommended to go to this design thinking workshop. And I was just thinking, like, if she didn't, what would have happened, right? And I went to the, the design thinking workshop. And if, if I didn't meet Tracy, what would have happened? If she didn't give me the opportunity to teach with her, what would have happened? Because that's how how it led me to Pfizer. Yeah. So Tracy, you know, she teaches, well, still now, but at that time she was teaching in many different organizations, not just at university. So she was teaching both at Stanford and and Cornell University. And through Cornell, they had a Cornell executive education where they brought executives together to show different way of innovation methodologies. And one of that was design thinking. And she asked me whether I would like to co-facilitate the session with her. And I always say yes, if I, if I have the, that weekend um, or the time available, oftentimes I'll take vacation days from my work and I'll just take off and learn because I'm thinking like, you know, where else can I learn these wonderful things? Sure. And so one of those times was this weekend design thinking workshop boot camp that Trace, Trace was leading and there were two Pfizer executives who came to join this boot camp, and one of them was assigned to me. So design thinking workshops are not like 25 or 100 people in a room just listening in. There are small groups, usually with five members and one coach, and there's a main facilitator. And so this person was assigned to this my small group, and he was really open-minded, very humble, and was really curious about what this can do. And he actually said, like, this is how I think. And I'm so glad that there is actually a name for it. And he asked me whether I could help him with his own project. It was not a Pfizer project. It was, he was actually working to help his sister, who was vice principal at a vocational school in Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. So I actually helped him to design design thinking bootcamp for the students. And we, we had a lot of fun. And he asked me at that time, so this one going back to five years ago, whether I would be willing to join his team. And he said, we don't have a design thinking group within Pfizer. At that time, they didn't have it. And he said, however, since you are an engineer, I don't think it will be that difficult for you to learn the operational aspect of my, what my team does. But if you could come, I would like you to apply this human-centered way of problem-solving for my team. I'm not going to try to change the whole organization, yeah. but I'm, I would love for my team to learn how to do this. And that was the beginning of my journey at Pfizer. And when I joined, you know, you think about this large organization, 90,000 people with, you know, the world known company, right? I thought people will be very close-minded. And that's just my way of like thinking. Like I thought this scientist, you know, very boring. Uh, but what I was surprised by was everyone that I met, they were really almost hungry for new approach of breaking through different way of doing things. And so I was just fortunate, you know, that, that I met him and then he brought me to this group and my group was also very open to new way of doing things. And he introduced me to the group by saying like, Lee is not going to be the kind of like same people that you have met. She is a little crazy. (laughs) Well, this is before the hat. It's even before the hats. 
So even before I made pipe cleaners, yeah, <laughs> this is before that. She's a little crazy, but I think she will bring some new ideas into our group, and we should give it that, that a try. Design thinking a little try, and eventually. You know, I was able to not only work with the group that he brought me into, but also with other groups. And as I go through the corporate world, what I see is always like, how can I add value to the team that I meet, the people that I meet? And is there anything that we can do together? I am, I'm always looking for a way to like, can we do something together? Can we push some ways of doing things together? Yeah, so I've been thinking a lot about like how lucky I am to have been assigned to a person who was open-minded, right? And then who was open enough to bring me to the company that does not have this kind of practice at that time, at least from his group. And all along the way, even after he retired after a couple of years and my new manager was also very open-minded and like thinking back to those times, I've been with Pfizer for now almost five years and like, how did I get so lucky? You know, how did I get so lucky with meeting these wonderful people, giving these opportunities and being able to do amazing things? And yeah, I, I don't think I could have designed that. No, I mean, it doesn't sound like it's something that happens by design, you know, but, but it's, it's, you hear this again and again from people who kind of, you know, find their path and are enjoying themselves is, yeah, you know, I sort of I either just fell into this or, an opportunity came up where I met this person, which then opened up this door, but that's the way of things, isn't it? I mean, you know, I don't, some people I'm sure can plan out the way that their careers go, the way that their whole, you know, if you own a company to some degree, or if you're, you know, an entrepreneur to some degree, you know, you, you do need to plan out how you want your company to grow, but you're not going to, you're not going to be able to plan some of the most important things that happen in your life, which is really serendipity. Right. And yeah, the whole the whole, the value of those serendipitous meetings of those chance encounters that aren't really necessarily, they're not exactly chance because, you know, you, you're, you're statistically, you're going to be more likely to meet people who are going to be able to help you or, or be along, be like, you know, uh, of like-mindedness. If you're all attending a conference, that's about the same top, then you already have something in common, right? Um, That that's the power of that, of, of your kind of immediate network. But Still, you know, those encounters that you have, you know, it's almost atomic, you know, where the molecules are bouncing into each other, you know, the, the electrons are smacking each other and, and you're generating energy. That's what it's like. You know, you, you're going to hit another electron and, you know, you're going to make energy together. And, you know, where those come from is sort of, it's a philosophical question, I suppose. <laughs> but those ser- serendipities, I think is such an important part. And, and I think, Think, and I think that you're kind of, you know, proving the point here is that curiosity is a fundamental requirement or a prerequisite to really be able to see and take advantage of serendipity. I don't know what order it comes in, though. You know, it's something to, that, that I think is, is really important to think about. So if you're not curious, you will not be open to those serendipitous meetings. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. You know, and that's also one of the reasons why, like, you know, the pandemic sucks because you're missing out on so many of those chance encounters. I mean, I'm, we're very fortunate. We have this, you know, we have Zoom, we have these things where like Brandon, for example, Brandon Wettstein, who introduced us, you know, that's a connection to a connection, you know, were it not for, if I'd go back far enough, were it not for me rethinking my entire kind of future and joining a specific networking group a couple of years back, I would never have met Brandon. Yeah. Like it would have never happened. I would have never learned about, or at least maybe, maybe it would have, you know, you never know, but I wouldn't have learned about Lego series play. I wouldn't have been as fascinated with the idea of visual metaphor. And then like, of course, Brandon introduced me to you. And I look the first time I see him, like okay, Lee is a walking visual metaphor. Like what, what is that on going on there? And, you know, the curiosity just is like, it's on fire. Yeah. So I don't know. I, 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 I'm, I'm talking too much, but I think you get the idea that curiosity is super powerful. Yeah. You know, and what you're accomplishing, what you're doing, it's not about luck. It's more about the energy that you give off. It's about that, that inspiring curiosity, which I think attracts 
luck, if you will, right? Like, like you know, it's you're a luck attractor in some ways. Maybe I don't know. Maybe that would be the title of the episode: luck attractor. Good. <laughs> I'm glad I'm a luck attractor. <laughs> I think you are. I mean, I get the feeling super positive. Definitely positivity. You know, but th- these are all these are all big important things. So you so you know, I I, I realize that we're sort of we're sort of running running out of time here, but you know, getting to this whole idea that, you know, you bring this curiosity work. I mean, you're working at Pfizer, 90,000 people, you know, the, the, the gray kind of the, the image of the lab coats and gray suits and so on, you know, obviously that's not the way it is everywhere anymore, but imagine, imagine you have this sort of gray world into which here comes Lee Kim walking through the door with a bright yellow pipe cleaner, like sculpture, um, bouncing around on top of her head. I mean, you must still get all kinds of reactions, even though after doing it for four years, people must be like, oh yeah, it's a pipe cleaner lady. I mean, yeah. are, are they accustomed to it now or is it still something exciting? Yeah. So now I only go in to work about once a week. Sure. Yeah. But when I go in and if there are people, I meet people who have known me before. And like, oh, you're still doing it? <laughs> you know, because <laughs> for the last two years, I in pandemic, I thought you obviously stopped. And I'm like, no, I'm still making it. Yeah. And there are people, new people that I meet. Like a few weeks ago when I went in, I was, you know, in line for, for coffee. And I was wearing green one. And the person was like, wow, what is that? And I told him and I said, do you want one? And he was like, oh, my wife would love it. And so like your whole, you're also giving it to family and friends and, you know, but you do get to understand the world is bigger than your connections. The world is bigger than your email list. And I think you're right. I think the way that I create probably the the energy that I give out is not by just me wearing it in my room. It's actually bring me out myself out there and then say like, I'm here. I don't know how to find you, but you obviously can see me. So come talk to me because I don't know how to find a curious person, open person, you know, a luck generator person, <laughs> whatever that might be. But um, <laughs> A luck attractor. Yeah, a luck attractor. A luck generator so, too, maybe. <laughs> I have found a lot more people now actually ask for one or two or three. And I have sent obviously, you know, a lot more than what I did in, in before pandemic times. Now I have, whenever I go into work, I probably will send to three because now I go to like different communities and, you know, I meet other people, uh, virtual communities. And if people are interested in getting one, I will just send me your snail mail address and I'll send you one. What is it going to be in my room? Nothing, just pipe cleaner heads, but in your house, maybe it will bring some joy. Well, you heard it here, folks. You can send <laughs> your address to, to Lee and then, you know, you get a beautiful wearable Tracy. And I mean, obviously I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to get one or two of my own. I have two daughters that my daughters won't, won't wear them, but I mean, it's still, I want to encourage that. I would love for them to wear them. I'd love for people to wear them out and just see what happens. It takes a certain, a certain, uh, I think mindset, like you said, to, to put yourself out there and be brave uh, and be courageous. You know, I am um, like, I'm, I'm, I'm super thrilled to, to just to continue to talk to you. I mean, is there a future in the wearable Tracy? Are you going to continue doing it? Is there, yeah. is there a plan or are you still just playing it by ear? No, I'm, I'm playing it by ear. So the first time when I made it, I didn't plan that this is going to be made into documentary. I didn't plan that, you know, I'll be meeting so many people, but I don't have a plan to stop. Good. So I'll continue to make one whenever possible. And then at least my husband knows like what to get for my birthday. <laughs> so, Pipe you know. cleaners. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, uh, what an easy, what an easy Certainly. gift, gift, gift yeah. receiver you must be. <laughs> Lee, this has been tremendous. So I, I just want to ask you one final question, which is design thinking. You know, people are interested in this. Like, where can people go to either like what's a good workshop to attend or what's a good organization to, to check into? Can you tell us? I mean, there are, there are so many organizations and places where you can learn from. Ideal Youth offers really good design thinking uh, courses. But if you just wanted to get to know design thinking and who are in the design thinking, I actually have a global community called Design Thinking Zeal. Okay. 
you can visit my, oh, I, so my friend Andy and I created the Global Design Thinking Community Global Design Thinking Zeal. Zeal like Z-E-A-L? Yeah, Z-E-A-L, yes. So we meet every other Friday from 10 to 11.10 uh, Eastern Center Time. Mm-hmm. And we, are, we bring people together, we share ideas, you know, practices, stories. Um, that's a good way for you to get to know what design thinking is all about. You don't have to have... Is that on Facebook or LinkedIn or is it... No, it's a, it's a website. You can go to website www.designthinkingzeal.com and you can sign up. Designthinkingzeal.com. Okay, I'll put that in there. Sure. Design thinking. Zeal. And I think that's just to, for me, more than the courses and the workshops, getting to know people and hearing from them what their journey was like. And, and then from that point, there are a lot of ways for you to learn. I sometimes offer just to like a couple of hours of design thinking workshops just for people to sign in. But yeah, I think there is a danger in just like giving one academic institutions and uh, things like that. But there are, there are just so many ways to learn design thinking, but I'll be happy to talk about it. If you want to talk about it, just contact me and I'll be happy to talk to you. Well, I encourage everybody to go to designthinkingzeal.com and uh, learn more about that. Um, check out Lee's LinkedIn profile. I mean, you know, it's it's easy to find Lee Kim. I mean, obviously, there's, there's probably a lot of Lee Kims out there, but look for the Lee Kim. Uh, and, and believe me, when you see her profile picture, you'll know it's the right one. Because uh, hint, pipe cleaner hat. <laughs> so so you'll see the pipe cleaner hat and uh, and please do connect with her on LinkedIn. Is there any other, are you active on other social channels, Lee, like that people should look at? Instagram, I hope so, yeah. Well, Instagram, yeah. So Instagram, we have Wearable Tracy handle Wearable Tracy. I don't do too much Twitter. I do have a Twitter account, but I don't post much. So yeah, LinkedIn is probably the best way because I do post a lot of workshops and ideation sessions, volunteer opportunities that we can create something together. And then if you want to see my Wearable Tracy, um, then you can go into my Instagram. Yeah. It's crazy. These are such beautiful, beautiful constructions. I, I, I don't even want to call them hats. I mean, I'd call them hats many times, but because they're on your head, but they're really like objet. I don't know what, to, what else what else to call them. They're just they're they're just gorgeous to look at. Look, Lee, this has been a tremendous pleasure. I'm so happy that we spoke. Yeah. And you know, it's uh, it's just it, it it amazes me how bright and cheery and just how you just sort of emanate positivity. I'm feeling so much better after. I mean, I was feeling good what before I got on the on our on our session here. Now I'm feeling even better. I highly recommend everybody just to to check Lee out. And beyond that, you know, I just wish you the, the very best. And I, and I reserve the right to bring you back again, because we have a lot more to talk about. Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. Thank you so much for having this conversation. It always is a pleasure to just to share my stories and hear some of yours. Thank you so much.